The Mexican Empire Spanish, Imperio Mexicano or Second Mexican Empire Spanish, Segundo Imperio Mexicano was the name of Mexico under a limited hereditary monarchy declared by the Assembly of Notables on July 10, 1863, during the Second French Intervention in Mexico. It was created with the support of Napoleon III of France, who attempted to establish a monarchist ally in the Americas. A referendum confirmed Austrian Archduke Ferdinand Maximilian, of the House of Habsburg-Lorraine, as Emperor Maximilian I of Mexico. Promoted by the powerful and conservative elite of Mexico's ascendados, with the support of the French, as well as from the Austrian and Belgian crowns, the intervention attempted to create a monarchical system in Mexico, as it had functioned during the 300 years of the Viceroyalty of New Spain and for the short term of the imperial independent reign of Emperor Augustine I of Mexico. Support came mainly from conservative Catholics, who were at the time a majority within Mexico, and the main means came from the Mexican nobility, who aimed to promote stability. The empire came to an end on June 19, 1867, with the execution of Emperor Maximilian I. History The rule of Emperor Maximilian was blemished by constant conflict. On his arrival in 1864 with his wife, Empress Carlota of Mexico, daughter of King Leopold I of the Belgians, he found himself in the middle of a political struggle between the conservatives who backed him and the opposing liberals, headed by Benito Juárez. The two factions had set up parallel governments, the conservatives in Mexico City controlling central Mexico and the liberals in Veracruz. The conservatives received funding from Europe, especially from Isabella II of Spain and Napoleon III of France. The liberals found backing from United States presidents Abraham Lincoln and Andrew Johnson after the US had finished its own civil war in 1865. The United States government viewed Emperor Maximilian as a French puppet and did not regard his reign as the will of most Mexicans or see him as the legitimate leader of Mexico. They demanded the withdrawal of French forces and France acceded. In 1867, the empire fell and Maximilian was executed at the orders of Benito Juárez, in the Cerro de las Campanas near Curitaro. Maximilian proved to be too liberal for the conservatives, and too conservative for the liberals. He regarded Mexico as his destiny and made many contributions. Before his death, Maximilian adopted the grandsons of the first Mexican emperor, Agustín de Iturbide, Agustín de Iturbide y Green and Salvador de Iturbide y Marzán. Topic. Role of France Napoleon III had more ambitious goals than the recovery of France's debts. Heavily influenced by his wife Empress Eugenie, he was intent on reviving the Mexican monarchy. Prior to 1861 any interference in the affairs of Mexico by European powers would have been viewed as a challenge to the U.S., and no one wanted to provoke a conflict with them. In 1861 the U.S. was embroiled in its own conflict, the American Civil War, which made the U.S. government in Washington, D.C., powerless to intervene. Encouraged by Empress Eugenie, who saw herself as the champion of the Catholic Church in Mexico, Napoleon III took advantage of the situation. Napoleon III saw the opportunity to make France the great modernizing influence in the Western Hemisphere, as well as enabling the country to capture the South American markets. To give him further encouragement, there was his half-brother, the Duc de Morny, who was the largest holder of Mexican bonds. Topic. Chronology Topic. Economy Topic. Railways One of the main challenges encountered by the emperor was the lack of sufficient infrastructure to link the different parts of the realm. The main goal was connecting the port of Veracruz and the capital in Mexico City. In 1857, Don Antonio Escondón secured the right to build a line from the port of Veracruz to Mexico City and on to the Pacific Ocean. Revolution and political instability stifled progress on the financing or construction of the line until 1864, when, under the regime of Emperor Maximilian, the Imperial Mexican Railway Company began construction of the line. Political upheaval continued to stifle progress, and the initial segment from Veracruz to Mexico City was inaugurated nine years later on January 1, 1873 by President Sebastián Lerdo de Tejada. 
In 1857 the original proprietors of the government concession, the Maso brothers, inaugurated on 4 July the train service from Tlatelolca, in Mexica City, to the nearby town of Guadalupe Hidalgo. Eventually they ran out of funds and decided to sell it to Manuel Escondón and Antonio Escondón. The Escondón brothers continued working in the project, and Antonio Escondón visited the United States and England in the last months of the year. In the first country, he hired Andrew Talcott, and in the latter, he sold company stock. Exploration of a route from Orizaba to Maltrada was performed by engineers Andrew H. Talcott and Pascual Almazan. During the French intervention, part of the railways were destroyed. The only option available was the establishment of a pact between the French army, and the two companies of the Escondone brothers. The French army was to provide a subsidy to the companies of 120,000 francs a month for the works, and the companies were to establish service from Veracruz to Soledad Para by May, actually concluding on August 15, 1862, concluding 41 kilometers of tracks. Next they reached the Cameron station, with a length of 62 kilometers. By October 16, 1864, they reached Paso del Macho with a length of 76 kilometers. On September 19, 1864, the Imperial Mexican Railway Company, Compañía Limitada del Ferrocarril Imperial Mexicano, was incorporated in London to complete the earlier projects and continued construction on this line. Escondón ceded his privileges to the new company. Smith, Knight & Co. was later contracted in 1864 by the Imperial Mexican Railway to continue work on the line from Mexico City to Veracruz. William Elliott was employed as chief assistant for three years on the construction of about 70 miles of the heaviest portion of the Mexican Railway, after which he returned to England. He had several years of experience building railways in England, India, and Brazil. In this last country, he held the position of engineer-in-chief of the province of São Paulo. Maximiliano I hired engineer M. Lyons for the construction of the line from La Soledad to Monte del Chiquiwit, later on joining the line from Veracruz to Paso del Macho. Works were begun in Maltrada, at the same time that the works from Veracruz and Mexico City kept moving forward. By the end of the empire in June 1867, 76 kilometers from Veracruz to Paso del Macho were functional part of the concession to Lyons and the line from Mexico City reached Apazaco with 139 kilometers. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Banking. Before 1864, there was no banking in Mexico. Credits were obtained from religious orders and merchant guilds. During the French intervention, the branch of a British bank was opened. The London Bank of Mexico and South America Limited began operations with a capital of two and a half million pesos. It belonged to the Bering Brothers Group, and had its head office in the corner of the Capuchinas and Lerdo Streets in downtown Mexico City. <laughs> Foreign trade At the beginning of the American Civil War, the city of Matamoros was simply a sleepy little border town across the Rio Grande from Brownsville. It had, for several years, been considered a port, but it had relatively few ships arriving. Previous to the war, accounts mention that not over six ships entered the port each year. Nevertheless, in about four years, Matamoros, due to its proximity to Texas, was to assume state as a port, and multiply its inhabitants in number. Following is a quote from a Union general in 1885 describing the importance of the port in Matamoros. Matamoros is to the rebellion west of the Mississippi what New York is to the United States. Its great commercial and financial center, feeding and clothing the rebellion, arming and equipping, furnishing it materials of war and a specie basis of circulation that has almost displaced Confederate paper. The entire Confederate government is greatly sustained by resources from this port. The cotton trade brought together in Baghdad, Tamaulipas and Matamoros over 20,000 speculators from the Union and the Confederacy, England, France, and Germany. Baghdad had grown from a small, seashore town to a full-pledged town. The English-speaking population in the area by 1864 was so great that Matamoros even had a newspaper printed in English. It was called the Matamoros Morning Call. In addition, the port exported cotton to England and France, where millions of people needed it for their daily livelihood, and it was possible to receive 50 cents per pound in gold for cotton, when it cost about 3 cents in the Confederacy. And much more money was received for it laid down in New York and European ports. 
Other sources mention that the port of Matamoros traded with London, Havana, Belize, and New Orleans. The Matamoros and New York City trade agreement, however, continued throughout the war and until 1864, and it was considered heavy and profitable. By 1865, Matamoros was described as a prosperous town of 30,000 people, and Lew Wallace informed General Ulysses S. Grant that neither Baltimore or New Orleans could compare itself to the growing commercial activity of Matamoros. Nevertheless, after the collapse of the Confederacy, gloom, despondency, and despair became evident in Matamoros markets shut down, business almost ceased to exist, and ships were rarely seen for sale. Signs began to sprout up everywhere, and Matamoros returned to its role of a sleepy little border town across the Rio Grande. The conclusion of the American Civil War brought a severe crisis to the now abandoned port of Baghdad, a crisis that until this day the port has never recovered from. In addition, a tremendous hurricane in 1889 destroyed the desolated port. This same hurricane was one of the many hurricanes during the period of devastating hurricanes of 1870 to 1889, which reduced the population of Matamoros to nearly half its size, mounting with it another upsetting economic downturn. Territorial division Maximilian I wanted to reorganize the territory following scientific criteria, instead of following historical ties, traditional allegiances and the interests of local groups. The task of designing this new division was given to Manuel Orozco y Berra This task was realized according to the following criteria. The territory should be divided in at least 50 departments. Whenever possible, natural boundaries shall be preferred. For the territorial extension of each department, the configuration of the terrain, climate and elements of production were taken into consideration so that in due time, they could have a roughly equal number of inhabitants. On March 13, 1865, the new law on the territorial division of the Mexican Empire was published. The empire was divided into 50 departments departamentos. The information from this table was the estimate for the year 1865. Topic. Legacy Today, the Second Mexican Empire is advocated by small far-right groups like the Nationalist Front of Mexico, whose followers believe the empire to have been a legitimate attempt to deliver Mexico from the hegemony of the United States. They are reported to gather every year at Curitaro, the place where Maximilian and his generals were executed. In popular culture The 1970 film Two Mules for Sister Sara was set in Mexico during the years of the Second Mexican Empire. The two main characters, played by Clint Eastwood and Shirley MacLaine, aided a Mexican resistance force and ultimately led them to overpower a French garrison. The 1969 film The Undefeated starring John Wayne and Rock Hudson portrays events during the French intervention in Mexico and was also loosely based on the escape of Confederate General Sterling Price to Mexico after the American Civil War and his attempt to join with Maximilian's forces. The 1965 film Major Dundee starring Charlton Heston and Richard Harris featured Union cavalry supplemented by galvanized Yankees crossing into Mexico and fighting French forces towards the end of the American Civil War. The 1954 film Vera Cruz was also set in Mexico and has an appearance of Maximilian having a target shooting competition with Gary Cooper and Burt Lancaster's character at Chapultepec Castle. Maximilian was played by George McReady, who at 54 was 20 years older than the Emperor was in 1866. The 1939 film Juarez featured Paul Muni as Benito Juarez, Betty Davis as Empress Carlota, and Brian Ahern as Emperor Maximilian. It was based, in part, on Bertita Harding's novel The Phantom Crown 1937. In the Southern Victory series by Harry Turtledove, Maximilian's empire survives the turmoil of the 1860s into the 20th century due to the Confederate States emerging victorious in its battle against the United States of America in the War of Secession. Thus, the United States becomes too weak and unwilling to pressure Maximilian's puppet state to capitulate to rebels and dissolve. 
It fights alongside the Confederate States against the United States in 1881–1882, 1914–1917 and 1941–1944 and experiences a civil war during the interwar years between Republicans and Habsburg Royalists. In 1881, it sold its northern provinces of Sonora and Chihuahua to the Confederacy and in 1944, it lost its extraterritorial province of Baja California to the United States after the Second Great War. The 1990 novel The Difference Engine, co-authored by William Gibson and Bruce Sterling, is set in an alternate 1855 where the timeline diverged in 1824 with Charles Babbage's completion of The Difference Engine. One consequence is the occupation of Mexico by the Second French Empire with Napoleon III as the de facto emperor instead of the installation of Emperor Maxilian. In Mexican popular culture, there have been soap operas like El Caruaje. 1967, plays, films, and historical novels such as Fernando del Paso's Noticias del Imperio Biographies, memoirs, and novels have been published since the 1860s, and among the most recent have been Prince Michael of Greece's The Empress of Farewells, available in various languages. Topic see also First Mexican Empire Second French Intervention in Mexico Imperial Crown of Mexico Emperor of Mexico Mexican Imperial Orders Nationalist Front of Mexico Topic References Topic Bibliography Barker, Nancy N., The Factor of Race in the French Experience in Mexico, 1821-1861, in, Har, No. 59-1, pp. 64-80. Blumbeg. Arnold, The Diplomacy of the Mexican Empire, 1863–1867. Florida, Kruger, 1987. Cordy, Egan Caesar, Maximilian and Charlotte of Mexico, translated from the German by Catherine Allison Phillips, two volumes. New York, Knopf, 1928. Cunningham, Michelle. Mexico and the Foreign Policy of Napoleon III 2001-251p, online PhD version Pani, Erica, Dreaming of a Mexican Empire, The Political Projects of the Imperialist, in, Har, No. 65-1, pp. 19-49. Hannah, Alfred Jackson, and Catherine Abbey Hannah. Napoleon III and Mexico, American Triumph over Monarchy 1971. Ibsen, Christine 2010. Maximilian, Mexico, and the Invention of Empire. Nashville, Vanderbilt University Press. ISBN 978-0-8265-1688-6. McAllen, M. M. Maximilian and Carlota, Europe's Last Empire in Mexico. San Antonio, Trinity University Press. ISBN 978-1-59534-183-9. Excerpt Ridley, Jasper Maximilian and Juarez. London, Phoenix Press. ISBN 1-84212-150-2. External links Media related to Second Mexican Empire at Wikimedia Commons Mexico, the French Intervention and the Second Empire, 1862-1867 Imperial House of Mexico